Good evening and welcome to the May 15th, 2023 meeting of the Coeur d'Alene Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, Melissa, would you please get us started with roll call, please? Commissioner Cranston? Here. Commissioner Lean? Here. Commissioner McDowell? Commissioner Tate? Commissioner Hill? Here. Commissioner Bakes? Here. Commissioner Wood? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Um, Commissioner Wood, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance if we'd have everybody stand? Certainly. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do any of the commissioners tonight have a conflict of interest with any of the agenda items? Okay, there are none. And now um, our first action item then would be approval of the February 27th, 2023 meeting minutes. So moved. I'll second. Uh, moves been made by Commissioner Hill and seconded by Commissioner Wood to approve the February 27th, 2023 meeting minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. February meeting minutes are approved. Okay, Bill. Ready for a staff report? Sure. Nice to see everybody here. We're missing a couple. Uh, we have a new hire, Darren Rolwicks. He started last Monday. He has a, a good background in ball field maintenance and mowing. He actually worked in some major league ballparks for mowing that turf out there. So he's got a lot of good experience. And he has been placed on our mow crew of all places. <laughs> uh, good news, we haven't re got the letter, but we got the phone call. Our um, mooring dock, we did receive the grant uh, for that, so if you recall, it was a 300,000, 300,000, 300,000 uh, from the state, and we were throwing at 100 and a half. Um, I had some preliminary numbers come in. We have 500 to work with. Uh, that we'll see. We'll see how the bids go. But in today's, we're changing to composite deck instead of wood. We're going to build those similar. If you recall, um, when we brought this forward before, it's going to be like the launch dock. So it's, it has the steel frame and the poly floats underneath rather than logs. So mm. looking forward to that starting. We're gonna, Monty and I are gonna dust that off and get that advertised here in the next few weeks and get that out to, to bid. And then we'll hopefully get, uh, it's maybe the building could go on this fall if we can get, get it done uh, in time. Bill, yeah. go ahead and give that mic a good pull towards your mouth. Say that again? Go ahead and lift the mic up to your mouth there. There? That better? Perfect. All right. So, um, Mooring Dock, we got with the grant, and so we'll, we'll be moving forward with that. Uh, Riverstone Shade, ran into some trouble there. Um, we hit a water table. Those uh, footings go in about 14 feet deep, and we had some trouble with that. But uh, George Daly, over in our, he's an inspector in our billing department, has been very helpful. He's been out there uh, creating some solutions. Uh, creative solutions really to get those things done so uh, we got all the poles uh, in place the six poles and now that we're just uh, getting things ready to attach those sails here whenever they get all of the concrete work done and um, the park is a bit of a shambles right now we also have a uh, that construction going on we have at Riverstone they're, the water department is creating a loop in that area on their uh, delivery system so they're coming through our park to do that and so we're, you'll see a bunch of trenching and some things like that at the same time we're working with them to have install a water meter there for um, our irrigation meter uh, we use pond water uh, to irrigate that park uh, too many times uh, that pump goes down and we don't get water and it's being maintained by um, the riverstone masters association um, and sometimes the, it's not always their fault as far as is getting the pumps repaired, having the right people there to repair the pumps so we don't have water. This new domestic supply for irrigation will give us the ability to keep the park looking green when the pumps go down. So when the pumps are working and we can pull that water out of the pond, that's what we use, but 
like right now, uh, you're going to see it brown it up a little bit, and before we can get everything reconnected. And the vandalism seems to be a topic of Shoot. I talk about it too much these days. Um, bluegrass has vandalized real heavily a few weeks ago. We had shut it down, cleaned it up. Open it back up and they started a fire inside there. So right now, I don't know to tell you when bluegrass will be opened up. Uh, Are these the, the restroom facility? Yeah, I'm sorry, yes, yeah. thank you, the restrooms. Yeah. Um, so it's starting off with a bang this year. Uh, Northshire has been vandalized, bluegrass twice now. Landings got vandalized. So it seems that it seemed to be the trend these days. So. Just as an FYI to the public, the, those restrooms are closed due to vandalism. We'll get them repaired and up and running, and I hope that they don't get vandalized again because it seems to be the, the way of the future. Bill, would it be helpful to get an announcement to the press or on the city's Did website or something year. to yeah. explain why facilities are closed? Could Yeah, well, we'll that's a good idea, Chairman. I. Yeah, we'll, we'll post it. Um, and I, I did talk with the, the press and then even the broadcast media last year about the vandalism that we'd seen last year, which was the greatest we'd seen ever. Uh, it seemed to be trending to maybe track that. I hope not. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll post something to let the public know. And, and on that note, I mean, we had some vandalism at the pickleball courts. And what happened there, some skateboarders brought stuff in there in the evening times when the lights were on. So what we had done, we shut the lights off to discourage the use. Uh, so they were tearing up the surface on the, the futsal court, which is also used as a pickleball court. So we've left those off for a while. I, I'm turning them, get them turned back on and we'll see what happens. But they had created a, a new ramp and they were tearing the surface up pretty good. So um, we're, those lights will be flipped back on. This week, I think probably by tomorrow, we'll get those turned back on again. Um, but it's it's not a, it's not a good sign. But I, I think we we'll get through it. We always do. And the the little skate park out there at Sunset Park is being vandalized all a lot as well. And so we're in some discussions with staff about whether or not we actually just take that little skate park, which was that. If you recall, it was that other, that older parking lot area that was just to the to the west of the new parking area. So we closed that down and created a new skate park. But the the kids are just tearing it up and graffiti it, tearing the the ramps themselves apart. Had to get our welder over there to uh, tack things together because they were bending up the ramps and tearing things off the the siding. So I don't know if that one's maybe short lived. Uh, we'll just keep an eye on it, see what happens there. And then, oh, well, on, on good news, um, we're flower orders coming in this uh, week. We have about 5,000 flowers annuals that we put out every year. So the, the bulk of that order comes here in a waterfront corridor. Some of the other parks get um, flowers in front of their signs near those parks, but we just do a much larger uh, display of flowers here along Front Avenue. So that, there'll be some, of, some of that will be coming in next week. We get the order this week, we'll line it out, we'll get everybody planting flowers. And so you'll see what you normally see in the years past along Front Street. And I've been working with the museum board on their landscaping for their spot here, just to the um, south of City Hall parking lot. Uh, met with the architects, I made some changes to their design, cut some things, changed some, uh, you know, oh, the sizes of plants to save some money, uh, number of plants to save some money and hopefully we'll have that back in our hands here in the next uh, 10 days to two weeks and go to advertise for bids for the landscaping portion of that. Um, the interior portion is private, uh, being that it's outside, uh, the landscaping is on public land, park land, city land, uh, so therefore it requires us to go out to bid and be, uh, have a competitive bid process there. And finally, our harbor docks, um, the harbor center docks, they're scheduled to be online, uh, not this weekend, next, Memorial Day weekend. They're hoping to be up and running at that point. So, and that's about all I've got for you. Bill, I've got a question for you regarding the mooring dock grant. Yes. Um, you'd made a comment in our February meeting regarding the dump station down there and, and the slight impact that the new uh, fireboat house had under this grant are we addressing the relocation of yes. that yeah 
dump station. And, yeah. and so what I'm going to do with a couple of those items, because I'm worried about the, the bid coming in, I'm going to do some ad alternates. And I actually spoke with Nick Snyder today through email uh, about that, because they maintain that for us. Uh, he's going to attach a, a longer hose. Monty's got some signs coming forward that we're going to close one of those bays that, that it says, you know, pump out station only. So, and then we'll relocate that to the proper location and then sign it when we rebuild the docks. And the same with the lighting. Um, I may pull that out as an ad alternate. May not on that. That one's all, all really important, so I don't want to have an ad alternate. I haven't quite got through the, how I'm going to do it because I, I'm really worried a number, a preliminary number I got was pushing 500000 already, and they excluded the lighting and the pump out station. Okay. So I'm toying with an idea how to do the ad alternates. We may have to throw some extra capital at that to make this project come together. The good news is that we have the capital um, set aside in our parks capital improvement fund. Uh, so I've been padding that with anticipation of this work. So we may be coming back and talking about some change orders and stuff like that as we move forward. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else for Bill? Christy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Bill, we want to talk about Atlas. I noticed that the, I don't know if you purposely killed the clover, but the landscaping's looking rough. I'm just not sure what's happening this year. That took a real hit with our early winter. <clears throat> Um, even the dogwood outside my office here is still looking pretty shabby from last winter. Um, so yes, the, a lot of that clover died. Uh, it was too, it got too cold too fast. And so we took advantage of that since the, uh, contractor installed the improper, uh, clover. Right. We're on, uh, schedule to have that reseeded with the proper clover next week. So they put in common. We asked for white Dutch, which is a little bit smaller, a little hardier. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it did happen. And so it's just that that cold snap was something that a lot of trees and shrubs aren't recovering very well from. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the weird part of it is the one that, that looked the worst were the ones in the island in the parking lot. The beach is coming along pretty just, just fine. And it's the same... It's the same clover. So I don't know why it would be that those individual, there's four of them, the, the three islands in the parking lot and one next to it, just didn't respond as well as the beach did or the swale. The pile of snow? Maybe. I, I don't know. I, you know, we usually push that to the, the other end. So I, I don't know what it would, would be. Um, mm -hmm. I could say that being where it's at in a sun situation, there's residual heat from the asphalt and reflective heat that could cause damage. but. A cold snap like that, I don't know why it would do that, but it did. So we took advantage, uh, sprayed it, and killed any of the bluegrass that was in it. So we then got it prepped for the right seed. And, and like I said, you'll see that next week. What about the entry into the park? You know, there's a whole lot going on there with construction, but is that going to be landscaped with some nice clover? Or? So as you come down, Suzanne? Uh huh. Yeah, that's going to be part of the, one of those HOAs. That's not ours. It'll be part of that. So I think there's three, maybe four different HOAs. There'll be a master similar to what's happening at Riverstone, I think. Mm. But it, it's not ours. So ours picks up right at the moment when you hit that sign that says Atlas Waterfront Park, and then, then that's us. But okay. that stuff on that piece that as you're coming down that hill, that'll be on the HOA. Great. And the same thing's true as you come in when they get that uh, the Atlas entrance in. That that'll you know that sign that's going to go in there, and all the improvements around that will be done by an HOA, not by us. Okay. Thanks. Anything else for Bill? Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, do any of the commissioners tonight have any comments or announcements? Nope. Okay, uh, is there anybody in our audience tonight that would like to uh, make a public comment that isn't here on a agenda item? Okay. <clears throat> and that brings us uh, to an information item, Bill. Uh, Relief Coeur d'Alene. It's all Nick Good Goodwin. It's his, his show here. It's all yours, Nick. Hello. Let me get my computer opened up here. Pleasure to be here tonight. Going to talk about. I think if you guess, I'm probably going to talk about mainly trees. 
as usual, if my program will open up. And here we go. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here before the commission again. Uh, so I'm here today to talk about a program we just wrapped up, which you may see every year, called Relief Coeur d'Alene. Uh, this is a planting program. It's for single-family residential homes within the incorporated limits. Unfortunately, we don't have a program that that's for commercial properties for planting, and we cannot do single-family homes. The reason for that is the funding. The funding for this program comes from abandoned street tree permits. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, yearly plantings. We've been doing this program since 2006, so 17 years. Um, so those permit fees, every time someone builds a house, a new home in Coeur d'Alene, the contractor pays a $300 permit fee. Now the contractor then, once they plant the tree, has the ability to come to us for a refund. We do that in order to make sure that we have trees planted in the frontage in our new neighborhoods. Now, for years and years before I came here, a lot of the builders would choose not to plant those trees and not get their refund back. A financial decision, most likely. But that led to us having a pretty exuberant amount of funds from this program, tried to find a way to do something with them. Through that, we established this planting program. We've also established our cost share program that you see talked about here in Coeur d'Alene. That's how we help the public care for trees in the public right of way. Through this program, since 2006, we have planted over 1,300 trees in public right-of-way locations all throughout Coeur d'Alene. So first in line are homes that have forfeited funds, meaning their permits are, haven't been given back to them. They haven't got their $300. So we check in with them to make sure they have a tree planted. And if they don't, they would get first dibs, so to speak, on signing up for this program. Um, we coordinate all the planting as far as setting up the locations, working with the homeowners, finding the species and then ordering the trees. We do order those trees from different growers. We get those trees at wholesale cost, so we try to do it as affordably as we possibly can. Um, the plantings traditionally have been contracted. Usually we put this, con this planting out to bid, select the lowest bidder on the contract to go plant however many trees we're doing. Ranges from 65 trees roughly to about 120 trees, depending on how, how much interest we have in the program every year. Um, after we plant the trees, the homeowners are responsible for those trees to take care of them and try to make sure they survive and give us the canopy that we're looking for. As you know, homeowners are responsible for trees in the public right-of-way abutting their homes here in Coeur d'Alene. All plantings are inspected. We provide aftercare instructions for the trees, how to take care of them, when they should be pruned, how much water to give them, try to make sure they have a good start. And this, is, helps, to, this helps to build a tree canopy in our new neighborhoods. It also really helps in our older neighborhoods with some of the canopy loss we experience when maybe we have a windstorm or we lose these mature trees in the garden district, things of that nature. Um, so Relief 2023, it's wrapped up and it was really a great program this year, um, mainly due to our expanded urban forestry team. Some of you may be aware that we have now merged the urban forestry department with the trails department. We are now one team calling ourselves the trails and trees team. Mm -hmm. uh, we've purchased some new equipment, we'll go over that in a minute as well. And through that, we have done some in-house planting. Uh, we're gonna have some long-term savings from this in-house work. Generally, we would award a bid of $10,000 to $15,000, give or take. Last year, we planted 76 trees. That gave us a total cost of $14,400 for planting to a contractor. Uh, doing that work in-house, uh, we spent $11,000 on a new uh, dump trailer that we could use to transport the trees all throughout town, bring the soil to sod, move that out, and then do the plantings all in-house. So in the long term, as we continue this program, the trailer has already paid for itself by not paying a contractor, and we hope that it will pay for itself tenfold over the next several years as we continue this program and also use it for different projects throughout urban forestry, natural areas, parks, all kinds of things. It's a really great tool. Here is that tool right here, loaded up with trees ready to go out to plant. Uh, we try not to do more than about 10, 15 trees at a time just so they're not stacked on top of each other too much and damaged. Uh, trailer has a nice uh, screen on the top of it so if we need to keep that protected from high winds or let's say it's loaded up with brush, we want to keep stuff from blowing out, um, we can do so. Um, the crew worked really hard this year planting. You can see them here on not the nicest day uh, really going to town on a, that's a, there, that's actually a, not a full of water hole. There's mud under it. 
that they're digging through, having all kinds of fun. I was, on, I was fortunately in the office that day uh, not taking part. Uh, and there's finished product on one of our trees. That's a ginkgo tree planted in the Garden District. That's a ginkgo biloba tree, one of the trees we selected this year. Um, and we always create a nice tree well, as you see in this picture, and, and try to leave it in as good a shape as we can. Um, so 2024 and beyond, what do we expect from this program? Uh, we expect to expand this program in the future now that we can focus on not having to find the contractor, because sometimes planting contractors can be a little hard to find in spring. These uh, businesses are busy, and we're busy too, but we can coordinate the plant planting and get it done. We were able to do this planting of 76 trees in five days of work with a four-man crew. Um, so due to those cost savings, we're hoping to continue this program and expand it. We're better equipped, and as our crew learns, they're going to be better trained. That will lead to hopefully faster, more efficient, and better work. Uh, investment of, co of cost and savings in the new equipment. We're looking at different options to make this tree team and natural air team as outfitted as possible. And if we can find creative ways to save money, like eliminating contracting fees that we might pay, making our work more efficient, we're hoping to put that into equipment like possibly a stump grinder, um, different trucks and equipment we need to do our jobs as well as we can. Expanded work, stump grinding, pruning, removals, we're hoping to try to alleviate some of that pressure on the homeowners by being able to bring this crew into their neighborhoods, do more pruning, do more removals where and when we can, and possibly more in the future. Um, fall planting of 2023, we may decide to do a fall planting in 2023. Uh, it will depend on the interest. And spring 2024 Coeur d'Alene program will happen. And the best way to encourage this program and support this program is if you have a home in Coeur d'Alene where you think there is a nice spot for a tree in your right of way to please sign up for the program in 2024. It is no cost to the homeowner and we do want to expand our urban forest. And with that, I would thank you and answer any questions you would have. Thank you, Nick. Any questions? Bridget? So did you say that it is strictly for the right-of-way area? It, it is. Okay. As these are public funds, we do want to plant these trees in the right-of-way. Okay. We get a lot of requests from people to have it planted in their front yards, and I have to tell them no every time. Right. Um, but, you know, we try to take whatever their request is about the spacing and the location, we try to accommodate that as mm -hmm. much as we can. I was also curious about um, what are the common trees that you end up planting? Um, it really depends every year. All the trees are from our approved street tree list, of course. Um, I have to work with the different growers and see what's available. We'd like to provide, we don't want to provide too many choices because that can become a headache for us and the public trying to choose between 20 different species. Um, usually we choose three or four species. This year we did ginkgo biloba, Kentucky coffee tree, um, Skyline honey locust, Japanese lilac trees, which is what we did for the power line and smaller planting areas. And we also did um, emerald sunshine elm, which is a disease, a Dutch elm disease resistant uh, elm. We're trying to kind of boost that elm population back up in our urban forest. Great. That's great. Commissioner, I'd like to yep. add something here. So Nick came to me a while back and asked about having this new crew. We reshuffled uh, the staff a little bit and created this TNT dynamite crew here with Monty and um, Nick. And Tyler Long has been assigned to that as another full-timer. Um, but it was his idea to say, hey, let, let's, we can do this in-house. And we had Erickson, Jeff Erickson rented, um, we were doing some demo work and rented a, um, a trailer that was a lift trailer. And he liked it so much that he bought one. And it's really become a very versatile tool. And so Nick was alluding to that with the savings. We purchased this other trailer. And today during our budget stuff, uh, Jeff Erickson had said that though we like those so much that we probably won't buy another dump truck. We'll keep doing these because the low profile makes the work so much easier. Um, you're not off the ground three and a half, four feet to lift up a picnic table or a large tree. You're really, what's that, a foot off the ground? Yeah, it's about a foot off the ground. Yeah. And so it makes loading and everything, even, even the things that we didn't think it would be good for, when we prune Northwest Boulevard Islands, we're having to throw that into the back of a dump truck. It's up and over. 
This way, it's right there, and you're pruning all of Northwest Boulevard, you're raking that stuff up, and you're only having to go about three, two and a half feet up over the edge to throw the debris in there. So it m went much quicker. But just kudos to, to the, these guys for doing this because, it, like you said, it's going to be $15,000, $12,000 a year in savings, and we did it in three days. So good Great. job. Thank you. I had a Christy? Quick question. Well, that's a gr what a great program, Nick. And I, I wanted to uh, bring your attention that I'm wearing the Tubbs Hill T-shirt tonight. <laughs> For those of you who missed uh, the video produced by the Tubbs Hill Foundation, Nick was in it a lot, narrated a lot of the tour of Tubbs Hill. It was so well done. And this was a packed house the night that it was shown. So kudos to you for all that you've done. You, I mean, Bill, you just have an excellent career. You know that already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm lucky. In fact, I've been having to pass out. he have been getting requests for autographs. So I'm having, having <laughs> well, to and Monty some was of part of it too. All the work. So a lot of work. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. I enjoyed yeah. that video. I'll take a, take a moment to just say, if anyone watching this online wants to see that video, it's a walk on Tubbs Hill. It's available on the city website. Okay. There is the long version, which if you really like Tubbs Hill, you may want to watch that one. I believe there's also a 10-minute version, and that may be a will, little well, more well-suited for people that just want to see me on TV. Right. Yes, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the presentation, <clears throat> Nick. And I appreciate it. Perfect. I have another one next, so I can stay right here and go into Great. it if you'd like. Okay. Well, let's roll right into <laughs> fuel mitigation of natural open space then. Mm. <clears throat> Forgive me. I have to start over. Forgive me. Get back up. I think I have some members of the audience that have been waiting for this, and then I messed it up right off the bat. So let's try again. Okay. So I get to stay up here for a few minutes to talk about some more upcoming grant work. I know you guys heard all about grant work a couple years ago for a long time up at the Fernan Hill natural area. So we wanted to include this area in that grant and through some teamwork with uh, Idaho Department of Lands and Kootenai County OEM, we've been fortunate enough to find a way to, to get this done. Um, so Veterans Centennial Fuel Reduction Grant work is upcoming. Uh, we have been awarded this grant and the work is planned in this 16 area, this 16 acre natural area which was donated to the city in 1990 by Emma Van Laken and the Seagraves family. Um, we mow the, ocean, the open portion of this natural area, which is approximately eight, air, eight acres. The remaining wooden eight acres is in a natural state. It's heavily wooded with an abundance of dead wood and ladder fuels. If anybody's been up there, you will know that it is a fairly dense wooded area, which is great in some ways, and in other ways, as we know, for fuel mitigation, it is not. Um, so we are once again partnering with the Kootenai County Operations of Emergency Management, the Idaho Department of Lands, Avista Utilities is partnering with us as there is a large easement right through the middle of this natural, of this wooded area. And the project manager for this is Steve Bladel from Inland Forest Management. He has written our prescription. I don't have the full prescription here, but I'll touch on some of the details and what everybody needs to know. We did invite members of the public to be here, especially from that community. I'm really happy to see that some of them are here behind me today to get some info. Um, so if anyone's familiar with the work we did on Fernand Natural Area, which I have some pictures later of some of the similar work in that area that you'll see here, this is a little bit different of a project. On that project, we really were concerned about a lot of the lowland brush in combination with ladder fuels as far as dead limbs specifically. Um, this is more of a radial thinning project. Uh, there's a lot of standing dead trees. There's a lot of trees that are suffering from different pests and diseases, such as grand fir, which is suffering from fir engraver beetle. We have Douglas fir, which is dealing with Douglas fir beetle. Um, that's the primary two species that are in that area and what we're trying to eliminate and help stop the spread of to try to promote as, promote as much forest health as we can as well as reducing those ladder fuels, which as you know, are the dry dead material and the lower dense brush and dense woody material that's in the lower portion of the forest 
that if the fire gets into, it's going to climb like a ladder into the canopy and then spread. So we're trying to eliminate those ladder fuels, and that's what we're talking about when we say that. Uh, most of this is going to be after removal, be done with chipping and mastication. You're going to see some brush clearing as well. As I said, it's nowhere near as dense in that area, but it, as far as nine bark ocean spray and shrubbery, but it is dense with dead wood and, and woody material. So the grant amount is 40, roughly $40,000. The city's in-kind match, meaning mainly from staff and volunteer labor where this will come from, not from direct funds from the city, is going to be $2,500. That's our portion of the boots on the ground uh, funds. Uh, timeline. The winning contractor has already been selected by our project manager. And this work will begin as soon as the weather allows. As it is so weather dependent, I really can't give an exact date. We are expecting this work and hoping for it to start in the next four weeks. Um, I wish that I had a timeline to say, everyone be ready on June 5th, you're gonna see boots on the ground, but I'm gonna get a call three days before they go up there and that's the notification I'm gonna get. Um, now the work must be completed by November of 2023. Our contractor is aware of that as well as the rest of the grant management team. Expectations, the minority of this timber that is, is, that's to be felled is gonna be removed from site. As you guys remember, you agreed to a timber uh, contract with the county. We're gonna get that wood off site. We really don't wanna see a large amount of green wood on this site. That can promote butyl activity, which is one of the things we're really trying to eliminate. Um, we're planning on really chipping and masticating the rest of the debris that's on the site. There is not really a plan to do burning. If there is any burning, it would be a small amount of pile burning. You're not gonna see a lower level forest burn <coughs> excuse me, or anything like that. Um, our goals with this project is to reduce the fuel loads in the natural area and create fuel breaks uh, between the natural areas and the residential properties. This is another wildland urban interface area, which is we refer to as a wooey area of Coeur d'Alene, where we have residential homes that directly abut the natural area. Um, now, public safety through hazardous fuel reduction is our number one priority with this project. We also want to enhance the natural beauty of, these, of this natural area and promote forest health. Um, we want to perform fuel mitigation efforts that we can easily maintain. And then the city's kind, in-kind match is going to go towards, we're planning on doing some trail improvements through there. I have verified with the grant management team that we're going to go through with our trails and trees team. We're going to improve that natural area to improve some walking trails through that area to try to make it a more usable natural area for the public, the residents that live there, the public at large that want to use, use this natural area, as well as really try to enhance the natural beauty. As always, we'll follow this work up with planting programs of native species of trees. We try to use native species of trees that will do well and also not deal with as many of the pest issues as we're seeing in this area currently. So a few examples of the kind of work you're gonna see. Now, this just shows this is a heavily wooded area on the Fernand, in Fernand natural area. Um, so it's this, the before pictures would show you how dense and crazy and wooded this was. Here, you're, this is what you're gonna see if you're familiar with that natural area is a more um, spaced out. You're still gonna have some snags in the area, some dead trees. It's not gonna be anywhere near as dense as it is right now with dead trees. Some people that go through the natural area right now may see some flagged trees that aren't dead. And some of those are flagged because a vista has identified them as needing to be removed for their utility easement that's in the area. And some of them are currently infested with, have living brood inside of bugs inside those trees that we're trying to get rid of. <clears throat> so neighborhood involvement. Um, the surrounding neighborhood is recognized as a firewise community. So anyone that lives in that area that wants, especially if you abut that natural area directly, you want to expand onto your property and do some work, you can use any funds you spend to go towards your firewise community requirements. As I know the eight, the, one of the HOA members is here, they're well aware that they have to spend a certain amount of money on fuel, on fuel reduction in their areas to keep that firewise community designation. Um, the homes directly abutting that area are going to benefit greatly from this. It really will make their properties much safer. Community members can contact Kootenai County OEM regarding their Fire Smart program. This is a way that they can, they can see if their property qualifies to get financial assistance from the county to do that fuel mitigation work. 
I'm not an expert on that program, but I do know when you agree to that work, you are agreeing to maintain it over a 10-year period. With that, I thank you. We expect the work to come in the next few weeks, four weeks, and it should take about two weeks for the work to be complete as far as the timber removal, the bulk of the project, and some follow-up chipping and mastication to come after that. I'm happy to stand for any questions. Any questions for Nick? It's a big project. Yeah. Well, we look forward to the project proceeding ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Okay, our final item tonight is an action item regarding the uh, Prairie Trail Extension bid contract award. Um, Lonnie, I'll go ahead and, and uh, read the staff report and then take it over from there. Okay. Uh, the decision point tonight is whether the Parks and Recreation Commission recommends to City Council to accept the agreement contract with interstate concrete and asphalt for the extension of the Prairie Trail from Hutter to Meyer Road. History. In 2008, the Prairie Trail was constructed by a combined effort with the City of Coeur d'Alene, Ignite Coeur d'Alene, the Croc Center, and the Centennial Trail Foundation. At the time, the newly constructed trail covered four miles from BV Boulevard to Hutter Road, although the first mile was later redesignated as a Centennial Trail. Since that time, the trail has become increasingly popular among trail users and has some of the highest trail user counts in the city. The park's master plan and the Kootenai Metropolitan Planning Organization non-motorized plan have called for extending the Prairie Trail, excuse me, the Prairie Trail to Highway 41, creating links from Coeur d'Alene to Post Falls and Rathrum. The city limits and the trail end at Hutter Road, but the old railroad line extends another 1.16 miles to Meyer Road and is owned by the city of Coeur d'Alene due to the land swap that occurred between the railroad and the Centennial Trail Foundation. The land later came to Ignite Coeur d'Alene through a series of loans and defaults on those loans and was eventually gifted to the city. The Trail Foundation has pushed to extend the trail for several years and even had an anonymous donor give $50,000 to help the project. Last year, the local Highway Technical Assistance Council awarded Coeur d'Alene a no-match grant in the amount of $250,000 for the extension of the Prairie Trail. The project went out to bid and interstate concrete and asphalt was the lowest bidder. Financial analysis. The city <coughs> received six bids with the bid from interstate coming in at $221,226.10. The next closest bid was for $285,774.30. The interstate bid was reviewed by city staff and was found to be responsive. The funds to pay for the Prairie Trail extension will come from the following sources. Children Pedestrian Safety Program Grant, $250,000, and the Centennial, <coughs> Centennial Trail Foundation, $50,000, for a total of $300,000. Accepting this bidder will allow the city to build a new portion of the Prairie Trail that will connect to the portion uh, the city of Post Falls will be building in 2023. By the end of this summer, the Prairie Trail will extend all the way to Highway 41. With the additional money from the Trail Foundation, crossing beacons, striping, and a connector trail up to Prairie Avenue could be added to the project. Again, the decision tonight, does the Park and Recreation Commission recommend City Council accept the agreement contract from Interstate Concrete and Asphalt for the extension of Prairie Trail from Hutter to Meyer Road? Good evening. Yep. Had a lot of grants this year. <laughs> a lot of grants. The more we're waiting to hear on for Tubbs Hill, and if we get it, that's be a $1.2 million in grants, over four different wow. grants. Incredible. Well, you're doing a good job in finding the grants and, and applying for them and yeah. successful and being awarded. So We get a lot of help. Congratulations. People, people send us all kinds of stuff saying, hey, look for this grant, look for that grant. So <laughs> it's really nice to have that uh, community of people out there looking out for us. So the Prairie Trail Extension Project, um, we became aware of a LTAC grant, um, and this is money that the um, Idaho uh, Walk Bike Alliance down in Boise has really been pushing the, the um, legislator down in Boise 
to really expand funding for that. I think it was $10,000 or something like that. And they managed to talk the governor into um, making it a $10 million <laughs> grant for last year only. Well, they pushed them again. They got $10 million for next year. So um, the, it was a no match grant. A lot of communities have been able to get this grant. And what it's for is safe corridors for children to get to schools um, from neighborhoods. It can be sidewalks, it can be trails, and th there are a couple uh, schools out there on the prairie and schools in Coeur d'Alene, so it's connecting two different three different communities uh, so kids can get to school safely. Uh, our crossing lights are a big part of that, getting them, the kids across Hutter Road and then Meyer Road will be a pretty uh, important part of that grant. So as you can see uh, on the vicinity map, uh, it's out of city limits. So that was a weird deal. You read about it in the, in the um, staff report that it was a bunch of land swapping and trading and defaulted loans and the city somehow ended up with property outside city limits. So uh, it'll, it will connect though. Uh, we're, we're ending just shy, 350 feet shy of Meyer or of uh, Prairie Avenue where, where that Prairie Trail hits Meyer Road. And with the grant coming in as low as it did, uh, we're working on some um, some different things with right away we may be able to use the extra money to get the trail up the west side of Meyer to um, uh, Prairie Avenue and so Post Falls has a, a developer on the other side building a big development in the prairie this year and they've uh, been required to build a trail or they agreed to build a trail from 41 to Prairie so we'll have we'll have the trail going all the way and there's already a trail up 41 that it'll connect a big loop around all of Kootenai County. It'll be amazing. Um, so, and in the future, they're looking for grants that Post Falls is to get the Prairie Trail under uh, Prairie Avenue. So if we, they, they're looking for money for grade separator crossing, which uh, we don't really have any of those other than the railroad ones that are already existing. So that'll be interesting to see. So this is a, a close review. Our current Prairie Trail ends here at Hutter. This is the 1.13 or 1.6 mile addition that ends right here uh, prior to where the uh, propane tanks. And the reason why we're going up to Prairie Avenue and over is because until we get a grade separated crossing, we don't want people crossing at a diagonal away from a light. And there's a light at Meyer Avenue or Meyer Road. So these are some of the existing conditions. You're seeing the end of the Prairie Trail. You're seeing Hutter, which uh, I don't know if you guys drive that much, but they go really fast there, not just 45. And then um, to the right, you see a couple other pictures of the current condition, the old rail bed. So it's just the one inch rock and weeds and, mm -hmm. and some trees and brush that have grown up. So the idea is that uh, they're gonna, the contractor will grade down to, to find a 20 foot bed and we'll put a 15 foot trail with two foot a shoulder on either side of the trail. Um, and then there, so they'll remove the brush and the trees. Uh, there are some, a couple culverts there that may have to extend depending on uh, how much dirt they have to dig down to get to that 20 foot bed. They're gonna shape the shoulders uh, so it's mowable because that's a big issue we have um, with people come in and build something and they don't think about, well, a, a mower has to go down that <laughs> two to one slope and try to survive so uh, they'll, they'll shape that we'll get it seated um, ourselves and of course there'll be our our normal standard uh, two inches of asphalt on four inches of base rock and it'll be a 15 foot wide trail and we, we use the driveway mix it's a three eighths inch uh, aggregate in the asphalt so it's smoother on your bike tires than your regular road mix so we had the pre-bid meeting on the 27th uh, we had a lot of questions and changes that, that the contractors always give you to, to try to live in their world. And so we did that, um, opened the bid, uh, interstate asphalt and concrete had the lowest bid. And so uh, of course that general services uh, meeting was canceled. So we're here with you guys going to city council tomorrow and we're hoping to uh, award the bid the following day. So construction will be uh, as soon as the letter, letter goes out, about May 20th, and they're, we're going to give them through, um, actually, I believe that, that date's wrong. It's going to be through October. Our, our, our meeting dates changed, and that date didn't get changed. So through the middle of October for 120 calendar days from opening to end. And uh, uh, that is everything. 
Okay. Questions for Monty? Just comments that this is incredible. It's going to make a huge difference to all the people that use our trails now. And just, it's, it's amazing, Monty. And I, again, really commend Bill and the staff and how much effort you put into trying to find these grants that really have a huge impact in our community. Um, we couldn't, certainly couldn't do it just with the city budget. Right. So this is really important work and I'm very grateful. It's giving people such access. Yeah, yeah that's great. You know, Bill, 15, 20 years ago, I couldn't have imagined having this kind of a discussion regarding, you know, the developed trail network we have and the con uh, connectivity that we have now. I mean, it was unimaginable just we've not that long a, ago. A, a lot of work has been done. community that wants trails, and we've got a guy here who's been spearheading that for all these years. 15 years ago, you're right. That's when you start, start seeing the change uh, with this gentleman right here. Mm -hmm. yep. I forgot to mention that there's also going to be crossing lights at uh, Hutter and hopefully at, at Meyer as well, the self-actuated solar-powered RRFBs, rapid flashing beacons. Wonderful. Great. I don't know what the other R stands for. Rectangular rapid flashing beacons. <laughs> that, that seems like a, a tremendous price for, for that much on the ground. That's, that's amazing that you're able to do that much. And if able to make that last 350 feet, that'll be marvelous, just marvelous. Thank you. Yeah. yeah some of those bids came in $150,000 higher than that, so we got pretty lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Monty. I appreciate Commissioners, it. I think that one of the things we got a good number on that is that they don't, they're not working on the roads. They're, they're off on that old right-of-way, that right. railroad right-of-way, and so they don't have to worry about traffic control, um, and they're not having to worry about cars coming around them, that kind of stuff. It gives them a little more freedom. So we were hopeful, given this location, we would get a good bid, and we certainly did. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's great. Good well, good luck with the project. All right, thank you. You're looking for a motion, Mr. Chair? I am. Okay. I would move that the Park and Recreation Commission recommend City Council accept the agreement contract with uh, from Interstate Concrete and Asphalt for the extension of Prairie Trail from Hutter to Meyer Road. And do I need to put the total cost in there? I don't think so. No, I think it's all probably it's all. in the contract document. Yeah. So is there a second? Second. Okay. Commissioner's been... Uh, Motion has been made by Commissioner Wood and seconded by Commissioner Bakes that the Parks and Recreation Commission recommend City Council accept the agreement contract from Interstate Concrete and Asphalt for the extension of the Prairie Trail from Hutter to Meyer Road. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion is unanimous and I guess it goes right to, back to you tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. There's the yep. yeah. council. So. Yeah. Mm. I'll see it all good, again. Good, good luck with it. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any comments or announcements before we adjourn? Um, I'll just announce that our next regular meeting then of the Coeur d'Alene Parks and Recreation Commission will be Monday, June 19th, uh, right here at 5.30 p.m. at the uh, Community Library Meeting Room. So with that, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, motion been made by Commissioner Lean and seconded by Commissioner Hill to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair.